Okay, so what exactly did we learn in the last class? Okay, according to myself, this is what I think we should have learned last time. The first thing that's important is to know that globalization and trade had already been a fact of life before the 20th century, okay? So when people are talking about globalization, when people are talking about trade, as if it were something that happened in the 20th century and 21st century, that's not true. We know, as a fact, that we have trade going on all over the world in the 12th century, 13th century, 15th century. And then we have an explosion in the 20th century. So the explosion in the 20th century and the fact that that's, that happened, we began using the term globalization, simply means that there is something else that happened in the 20th century that really made a difference in the way that things were traded in the world, the way communication was happening in the world. And so, as, as a matter of fact, what we need to understand is trade and free trade and the concept of free trade is not something that happened in the 20th century. Okay. This is something that has already been discussed from long before the time that we are talking right now. And one of the facts is when you look at the book of Adam Smith, Adam Smith is really saying exactly that. What he's putting on the table is free trade will make countries richer. Opening the economy will be better for the people in that economy, in that nation. And he was really talking about that because at the time there was something called mercantilism that really assumed that trade will only be beneficial to a country if you were exporting more than you were importing, and therefore that you are creating wealth through that process. That was really the point that was made at the time that Adam Smith wrote his book. And so he writes a book to tell people trade is good for an economy. Opening the economy is good for the people in that economy. It will create wealth. So this is what we are talking about right now in this particular section of the course. Why is it that trade is good? Do we really believe in that or we don't? That's a question that we have to ask ourselves. So what we learned last time was, when you look at what the 20th century is creating, globalization really takes hold because what you have now is better communications, better technology. And so it is easier and simpler to know what's happening in different parts of the world. And as you start doing that, the interrelation of different economies becomes stronger. Okay? Second thing that's important to learn is the middle class is really the major aspect of why trade becomes important in the world. And the first middle class that we have, the one that really changes the demand in the world, is the United States middle class, the American population. As they become richer, as they really have a stronger income, and therefore they really are able to expend money, they become the engine of growth for the rest of the world. So what you have is this incredible change that takes hold. And what takes hold is there is a middle class. And as the middle class starts becoming larger and larger in the society, what you see is a stronger sense of consumer demand in that economy. So the middle class is fundamental for what we are talking about. But what we are learning slowly is the middle class is changing the way that markets operate in the world. And an example of that is what's happening right now with China. As the rising middle class in China starts happening in the 20th century, as you have people who go from poor to middle class, they start demanding goods and products in a different way than the way their original society was doing it. And that's very important for us because what it means is all of a sudden you have this great number of people. We are talking about 300, 400 million people in China that all of a sudden become middle class. And as they become middle class, they demand goods. As they start demanding goods, they change the markets in the world. That's the reason why you had all this incredible surge in prices in commodities during the last 20 years of the 20th century and the first 10 years of this century. Because what's happened is you have a completely different demand in the world. As that middle class incorporates into the world trade, into the world demand, it changes prices, it changes demand, it changes consumption patterns in the world. 
Now, that's going to be important for you because you are in international business, and what you will be looking at is what's going to happen then in the long, medium term on the business opportunities for my company. Where will those business opportunities be? And as you look at that, then you find something which is interesting. The trends in population growth will tell you what markets are going to become important if they become middle class. So there are two aspects that you have to look at. One is, are they really becoming middle class? Meaning, are these countries really growing? Are these countries really creating a middle class in their societies? If that is happening, if Indonesia is growing fast and they are creating a middle class, if the Philippines is growing fast, if China, if India, if all these countries where the larger number of population in the world today exist are growing fast and they are really creating strong middle classes, what I can expect is that the markets in the world will change and that the consumer demand in the world will change. So if I'm a business person, I have to understand that this is the place where the markets will be tomorrow. And the markets are going to be very clearly, as we saw in the graphs, in Asia. Asia, who already has 57% of the population of the world and keeps growing fast, as they keep growing as economies faster than we are doing in Latin America and other regions of the world, what we know is those are the nations where growth is happening, where the largest number of people exist, and therefore we are going to be facing very quickly something which is amazing to any of us. We are going to be setting up shop in Mexico to send goods into Asia. Now, there are questions of why this happens. Well, basically for two reasons, population growth and the fact that those economies have really put together programs that are making them grow as economies faster than we are doing. If that trend continues, what we're going to be seeing is our markets being more and more important in those countries. And therefore, more and more, we will be looking at the semi-joke I was telling you last time. It is either Shanghai or goodbye. Either I move into Shanghai, either I really do these things, or I'm going to be without a job. And my competition is coming very clear now. If I'm a person who's working or is trying to put up a company in Mexico, I have to recognize that I'm going to be competing not only with Mexicans, but with people from all over the world. And as I'm looking at these things, I know that the biggest change that has created this possibility is the fact that costs, technology, and transportation are three determinants of where I'm going to be setting my plant. Well, last time we were looking at what's happening to the production of the plane, which is no longer flying, yeah, 787. And the reason why we're having all these difficulties in Boeing is because for the first time in many years, the production process of any company is no longer a production process that takes place in one single spot. What they do is they look for inputs all over the world. Outsourcing has become a very important element of the production process of any company. Outsourcing will reduce costs for that company. And because in this world we're now having competition from all over the place, if I want to remain competitive, I have to look for places where I can produce parts of my product at a lower cost, where I can get the best inputs at the lowest cost, so that I can, in fact, produce the lowest cost product. Uh, I was just reading an article that outsourcing is, gonna, is a tendency that is going to disappear because the cost of uh, what wages in China are increasing by 20% a year. Yes. So even though the tendency is still to outsource, the good, high uh, qualified jobs are going to be reshored, and that's like two fifths of the companies that were surveyed in the United States. So that's also another tendency. And that is called the conversions law. Okay? We're going to be looking at that in detail in this section. Because one of the important things that we need to understand is what are the theoretical basis for free trade and what it means in terms of the final result that we expect. Okay? So one of the things that we expect as a result is what is called the convergence law. Everything will converge. What will then converge? Salaries, costs. It will converge in the long run. 
Because in fact, if I start doing that, and I keep employing people there, then they will be demanding higher wages. And as they demand higher wages, the wage difference between my country and that country will start being reduced. So if I really believe in free trade, okay, if I really believe in free trade, then I know that according to the theory of free trade, there will be convergence of all costs, of all salaries, all over the world as the final destination point. Now, how long it will take? That's the question. So the big question for you right now is exactly what you were saying. What's happening to China? So China opens the economy, let's say, in the 70s, okay, of the past century. And from the 70s until the 10th of this century, they have a tremendous competitive advantage because of the wages that they pay. Now, of course, you are not interested only in wages, okay? As a company, what you're interested in is what's called productivity. And that will include also something which is important to you, which is quality. So it is important to go and put your company and get people because you are paying lower wages than in your country. But you also want to be sure that what you are getting is highest productivity. And you also want to make sure that you are getting quality. Otherwise, you have lithium that is really creating problem where for the Boeing 787. Okay, what well, they are using is lithium batteries. These lithium batteries are not made directly by the company. They are outsourced either inside the United States oil company or outside to anybody else. And they are now facing the biggest problem, which is because these are not working properly, they are corrosive, and they are creating fires inside the 787. If that's going to be the case, the problem that 787 is facing right now is very clear. Because I have this outsourcing type of production process, what I'm facing today is a war situation that if I had done it under my control in my own plant. This 787 business is going to be very interesting because what it is going to create is going to create a major question in the production of planes or of highly sophisticated machines. Because what's going to happen right now is a company like Boeing, if this thing really hits them as it is beginning to hit them, may be really damaged in the sales of 787. And part of the problem is because they have not full control of the quality of the product that was being brought as an input because they were looking for lower costs in the whole procession process. So interesting. We don't know these things. We don't know what's going to happen. And the reason why China was so competitive for a long time is because they really were beginning to produce quality products. At the beginning, you were in the lower end of the production, meaning by that the lower end products, the ones where people really didn't care that much about quality. And slowly they became more and more and more the kind of quality production society that we are facing today. As they do that, the problem they are facing is their wages are increasing. As their wages increase, they become less competitive as a nation in terms of companies willing to go to that place to make investments for that particular product. So what you see right now is another kind of theory, which is quite interesting which is called the migration theory of industrialization. Okay? And what you're going to be facing in many of these countries is you start at the lower end of the production process because you have a tremendous competitive advantage because of wage. But as you keep doing that, your wage scale goes up. And this industry will migrate from your country to the next country where they can do that. Okay, this is happening already. Mexico, products went to China. China, products are going out to Vietnam. Okay? Why? Because now you have the same characteristics of the original here. Now, the biggest difference with China is you have huge population. 1.3 billion people. That's a lot of people. Okay? Whereas in Vietnam, you're going to have 100 million. Yeah, but right now, textiles are cheaper to be done and performed in Vietnam than in China. So low-end textile production is moving away from China, 
and going into Vietnam or any of these countries. Burma is going to be soon. Oh, well, it's not called Burma, but yeah. So what's going to happen, as you look at these things, you have to realize that even though it's true that a country like China may be losing that competitive edge, it is also true that other countries are there that will be then taking their place. So if the textile industry in Mexico believes that because the Chinese wish are going up, I'm going to be competitive again as I was in 1994, the answer is no way, Jose. And the reason is very simple. There are many other countries that will be taking the place of China and substitute me. So later on will be India. Later on will be Bangladesh. Or they are already happening. I mean, if you look at your clothes and you see where they were made, you're going to find more and more and more that it will say made in Malaysia, made in Honduras, made in Nicaragua, made in many countries where the wage rate is very low. So it's never going to end, right? Like it's, uh, at some point it will end. Yes. But as, as okay, the, quest, the, the question you're asking is, in my lifetime, is that going to end? In the answer, uh, probably, is no. Okay? Why? Because we have almost 8 billion people in the world and keep growing. So what we're going to be facing more and more and more is, if we're really going to an open trade society, those places where people are willing to take the lowest salaries will take the production of goods which require lower salaries. But there is a big question here for you. Is that what we should be pushing for in a country? Do I explain myself correctly in the question? Is, is it really a low-end type of production process, a low-value added type of product, the ones that I should be producing in my country? So sh should my strategy as a country be, I'm going to be offering cheap labor to the world so that they can put here more and more of these low-value added products? The answer is no. We don't want that. We want high-value added, high-salary jobs. Because those are the good jobs. What means with when one country has a, a low cost? What means, uh, I don't know, like for, for example, now we man has a low cost of labor. And what is it means? Uh, Why is it happening? Yeah, what is it happening? Well, is it happening because there is something called education. And if the educational background of the society is low, then all they can perform is low tasks. Okay? And if that's the only thing that you can really provide for your people, then your whole economy has a problem, which is because I have not trained people, because I have not given them the elements to compete in this new world that we're talking about, they are condemned by my own policies to do and perform the lowest levels of jobs. Now, is that really what I want for my society? The answer should be no. The politician's answer is yes, okay? And where is Mexico right now? We're somewhere lost in all this place, okay? <laughs> and the reason for that is very simple. Our educational system is not a good educational system. So what you have is a lot of people who don't have the skills to perform the kind of things that we would like. And if we don't have those skills, then it is impossible for that population to really be able to perform the type of jobs that we would like them to have in the high end. Oh, but at the same time, we do have high end jobs, yes. If you look at the maquiladora industry in Mexico, if you look at the planes that are being now built in Querétaro, if you look at the automotive industry in Mexico, you will see all of this as high value added jobs where salaries are higher compared to the rest of the jobs in the society. But we still have a large number of people down there. And that large number of people is a pool of people who is willing to take jobs at the very low salaries and wages. That's one of the reasons why we have this migration to the United States. Because in fact what happens is the United States needs that kind of people to remain competitive in many aspects of their own production process 
They don't have the resources, meaning by that human resources, because either they are not willing to accept the jobs or they are better prepared and therefore are doing something else. So we end up sending our people there. As our people goes there, they start at this lower end and then they move. One of the most fascinating studies I've read is what's happening with the migrants from Mexico in the United States. And even though you may not believe this, they are no longer in the lower end of the scale of jobs in the United States. Because what's happening to our migrants is more and more they're going with better skills. And as they go with that, they end up now working more and more of them into the construction business in the United States. Construction business in the United States pays better than the hospitality business in the United States. And therefore, these people are now getting better jobs. What are they becoming? Plumbers? Carpenters? And as they become that, they have better wages in the United States. Oh, so who's taking then the jobs of uh, dishwashers? Yeah, a few Mexicans, sure. But mostly now are people from Central America and from other regions of the world. This is the law of conversions, okay? Slowly moves in that direction. Now it will take two centuries, maybe. So the reason why the wages in China are increasing is because they're getting more skilled. Absolutely. And because they are now beginning to produce higher value and you know, type of products. As you produce more cars, as you produce the kind of things that people are interested in, like iPhones, iPads, etc., those are in the high value added place. Bigger price, better price, and therefore they can afford to pay better salaries. But they require better skills. As you give those skills to the people, that people will be getting better salaries. Are those salaries the same salaries that you will be paying in the United States? No. That's the reason why they are in China. Okay? But slowly and futurely, they will keep increasing. Now, so the key question to all of us is, how do you make a society where you have a better income distribution process? Because what we want, what we are saying all the time is, we want a middle class. You want internal demand, internal consumption in your country, you need a middle class. This is the engine of consumption in any society. Okay? These are the people who have more than what is required to survive, and therefore they are the ones who start buying the jeans that you're wearing, the clothes that we're wearing, the type of things and consumption patterns that we are now acquiring. Do you think it's convenient for China to, to keep increasing their salaries? Absolutely. That's all, and then maybe everyone... Absolutely. Just remember one thing. They are 1.3 billion. Okay? There is only 400 million in the middle class. They still have to pull up 900 million. Um, how well skilled is United States workforce? Because if other countries' workforce is, is increasing um, and their skills are increasing and the wages, how is going to that affect the workforce in the United States if they don't keep pushing their education? That's one of the biggest questions that the United States society is facing right now. As my population becomes less skilled than the rest of the population, I'm going to be facing the same dilemmas and problems that those countries are facing, which is, I'm going to have a highly well-paid bunch of people in the top and a terrible situation for the rest because they don't have the skills and they don't have the resources, educational resources, to really be part of this society of production that we're talking about. Okay? So what globalization is doing today because of the quickness with what is happening and the way that it is happening is it's creating this obligatory process of you better increase the skills of your population because otherwise you're going to be left behind. So the law of conversion is going to happen both ways. One, because it's increasing, but the other one is because then I'm not going to be offering you the job. I'm going to be doing somewhere else. You're going to be without a job. And therefore, you're going to have to be accepting lower paid jobs. This is one of the biggest dramas in the United States right now. 
many of these middle income population, particularly the one at the bottom of the middle income scale, are beginning to face the fact that they are unemployed because they don't have the skills. Ah, well, this is a rich society, so they can afford to pay. But sooner or later, they won't have the resources. Now, is this going to take 50 years? I don't know. Is it going to take 100 years? I don't know. But decadence takes place if you don't keep pushing the things that make your society stronger over time. No country can escape from that. Okay? If you take a look at history, Great Britain was the power in the 19th, early 20th century. The United States took the place. So you have now that problem. One of the biggest problems that you're facing in the United States is this, this reaction from people that you are no longer the best. They don't like it. I've given speeches telling them that, and they really get upset. Because one of the things that you tell them is you have to realize that you're losing your edge. Either you do something about it, or you're going to be losing your edge. I don't mind. You know, I'm Mexican. But you should be very concerned about what's happening, because... The biggest power that you wear, you no longer are. You are still the number one country in the world, but you are not the overwhelming power. Now, for a society, it's very difficult to understand that. I mean, if you were born and raised in a place where people will tell you all the time, oh, you are the best, you are the best, you are the best. And then all of a sudden, I walk in and I say, you are no longer the best. You don't like it. So what you see in the political ground in the United States is a little bit of this battle. Okay? between people who want to remain the power number one and they believe that they can do it by the wrong policies. And we're going to check what are the wrong policies. Okay? So these are the trends, and this is the other thing that we learned last class. For any business, international trade and competition has become a fact of life and will have to be taken into account in any business strategy to be defined in the 21st century. Because we concluded last class saying, even if you have a small restaurant in this place, you're going to be subject to international competition sooner or later as the economy opens. Okay? Because all of a sudden, something called Starbucks shows up. All of a sudden, something called Applebee's shows up. And all of a sudden, you realize that even if you are in one of those businesses that you thought you will be protected from international competition, it's no longer true. In addition, your people are traveling. They're going to those countries and learning to eat Tex-Mex food. Yeah? All of us have some taste for Tex-Mex food. We like it. Don't tell me you don't, because we all do. So all of a sudden someone comes to this place, and on the side of this little business who has mole poblano, they set up shop with Tex-Mex shop. People begin to eat here rather than here because they are now used to Tex-Mex food. Every time you cross the border, you do that. You know, my daughter used to say that whenever you went to the United States, it was not Taco Bell, it was Taco Hell. Okay? That's a big difference. Tacos are not the same in Taco Bell than in a taqueria in Mexico. Yet, many people like them. So you are changing your cultural aspects. Oops. So, voila, trade is becoming more and more a fact of life in the modern world. This is uh, from a report from A.T. Kearney, and what they are showing very quickly is that because of the kind of agreements and things that are happening in the world, as of 1995, all of a sudden you have this incredible growth curve in trade, total trade in the world. It's becoming more and more an important fact of life for all of us. And yet, it hasn't necessarily brought all the benefits for everybody. So according to this report, you know, which is a report from the United States uh, office of, um, you know, the ones that make these projections in the long term, they are very concerned because of the fact that even though from 1992 to 2010, the world's overall GDP grew by 75%, and GDP per capita by 40%, in per capita terms, middle-income countries, 
So the fastest growth in the 2000s, followed by low income and then high income countries. And yet, in absolute terms, the per capita income differences between rich and poor countries has grown continuously. So anti-globalization people do have one aspect that they can utilize. And it is the fact that even though growth has happened in the world, even though trade has helped to increase rates of growth, its distribution of that wealth is not really being fair. Okay? And so what they are presenting is, when you look at the purchasing power, power, power parity, high-income countries have now five times higher than in middle-income countries in 2010. So yes, trade is happening, growth is happening, wealth is expanding, and yet it is not being distributed the way they should be. So this is the concern that we have to look at because what we have is average country level income inequality increased around 20% between 1990 and 2005, despite the surge in the size of the global middle class. The gap between rich and poor has widened in many developed countries in the past 20 years, and the average income of the richest 10% of the population is now about nine times that of the poorest 10% of the population. I'm an anti-globalization person. I walk and I say, trade is not fair. Okay? Trade is not fair. So we should not be pushing for free trade. Why is not fair? Look at it. Look at it. The world's overall GDP grew 75%. Per capita, 40% between 1992 and 2010. And yet, Income distribution has worsened in the world, between countries and within countries. All you have to do is look at Mexico. We open our economy, and all of a sudden we're finding something which is terrible. 30% of the population remains in poverty. 1%, the top 1% of the population in Mexico is super rich. I mean, you can give me names. You know the names. So 1% of the population is controlling the wealth. When I look at that map and I translate that map 20 years back, 50 years back, I don't find that skewed income distribution. So, ah, trade is not good. This is the question, okay? This is something you're going to be facing. That's why you need to either believe or not in free trade. You need to understand the theoretical foundations of free trade. Because what you're going to be really bombarded by is people telling you fair trade is important, not free trade. And this is unfair trade. The richest countries become richer, the poorest countries remain behind. You are exploiting the people in the rest of the world. You are paying them misery wages because you can take advantage of them. And therefore, what free trade is doing is worsening justice in the world. Okay? These are the numbers. This is not just someone throwing fluffy things. There it is. And so, what we are facing right now in the world is what is called ideology and the isms. Okay? What we are facing now is nationalism. And that translates into xenophobia, okay? Because what I have now is people walking and saying, we should protect our people. We should defend our sovereignty. We should be nationalistic in our approach. We should defend Mexico. We defend the United States. We should defend Russia. Each person in his or her own country will start using this concept of nationalism. And it becomes then a xenophobic society, rejecting foreigners, rejecting any foreign product. Okay? Think about it. It opens 
what we just saw before, this wealth distribution of trade. So unequal creates the possibility for politicians and for many people, either because of ideology or interest, to transform themselves into nationalists and therefore xenophobic people. And then, of course, that will bring you what kind of policies we should have in the country. We should protect our industry. We should protect our jobs. Protectionism, which is exactly the opposite to free trade. And so people are going to walk to you and say, this is not correct. Now, funnily, it's strange as you may think about it, you're going to be working your business, and you're going to be saying, yeah, it makes sense. I like that. I like protectionism. So let me tell you what. I do agree with these guys, because my business is suffering. And what I want is to protect me. And you have all these chambers of businessmen in Mexico walking to the government and telling the government, please protect us. These crazy policies of the past 20 years, 12 years if you are from different parties, were so bad that they have destroyed our industry. And therefore, please protect me. And then I'm going to walk and I'm going to say, wait, 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 wait. Look at the automotive industry. Look at the aeronautics industry. And they'll come back and say, oh, yeah, but those are all foreign. They are not Mexican. Tell me, the planes that are being built in Mexico, are they Mexican really? No, they are Canadian. It is Bombardier that is sitting there and producing them. And Bombardier is exploiting us because they are bringing these things so that they can exploit our workers and pay lower wages. Because if they were producing the plane in Canada, they would be paying 40%, 50%, 100% more to the people that were working in those planes. And therefore, they are exploiting our people. We should protect ourselves. Slowly, you have all these concepts leaking into society. This is what's called, therefore, the ideology and the isms, okay? I use all these things. And then, of course, there is something which is new to this century. As of 2001, terrorism and security became an important factor. And fair tradeism has become the word. The buzzword is fair trade against free trade. In English, they sound pretty close. Okay? Why did it happen? It happens for many reasons, okay? There are political reasons, there are many reasons. But the most important reason, and this comes from this document. This is not a required reading. If you want to read more, this is something. Plan survival, market fundamentals, and trade liberalization. Now, what they have done is they have prepared this paper. And looking at the paper, they have found the following. Independent of the state of market fundamentals. OK, so question for you. What are the fundamentals of the market? The fundamentals of the market? Who knows what are the market fundamentals? This is the question of a debate course, OK? You have to ask questions. So I come here and I tell you whatever I want, and you simply swallow it. That's nice. That makes my life very easy as a professor, OK? But I don't want that to be easy. I want it to be a challenge. And what I want you to understand is, if you don't understand things like this, then it's very complicated for you to really understand what people are throwing to you, OK? When you say market fundamentals, do you mean open market? What is the fundamentals of the market? OK, we studied macroeconomics or not? Okay. Supply. Offer doesn't exist. Supply, yeah. yeah. Demand supply, yes. Yeah, I was going to say, isn't it like the uh -huh. demand and supply? I walk to you and I say, Mexico is a great country. And the reason why it's a great country is because the fundamentals of its economy are very solid and reliable. End of my statement. 
you all sit there and say, yes, that's right. Why? What did I say? Resources? I don't know. Keep, keep trying. What are the fundamentals of an economy? How do I know if an economy is strong or is weak? Territory. Hmm? Territory. For instance? Territory. Territory. They have like resources and how they. So you would expect that to be important. Yeah? You have to check numbers maybe in the balance payment. Okay. Think about what you said. That will imply that a country has no resources, will have no chance of anything. Yeah? Because territory then will be the important issue. But then we have a country like Switzerland, or we have a country like Japan, or we have a country, you see? So the key question is really, even with the smallest resources that I can have, I mean, of course, if you're in the desert, I can have, of course, you have trouble there. But normally, the most important resource of a society is what? So the human resource is the most important. If I educate very well the people in a small country, then I can become a very important country. Now, will I be the number one in terms of the weight of my economy in the world? No. I mean, you know, if I'm in a society of 5 million people, like Singapore, even if I'm making per capita of $50,000 per year or 60000 or 80000 when I put them all together, because we are only 5 million, we're not going to be the largest economy. So when people say, for instance, China is only the largest economy in the world, it's true. That doesn't mean it's the richest. That means the largest. The United States will remain the richest? No, the United States is not the richest. In per capita terms, there are countries in the northern countries in Europe which are richer and the people are, live better than the Americans on average. Okay? Yeah, but, you know, Norway, it's a nice country. I don't know if you've ever been there. It's a nice country. Sweden, very nice. Swedes are really nice people. Yeah, but you know, there are so few of them. Hmm? We are 125 million. That's a lot. <laughs> so we count more in terms of the number, the sheer number. If I can make my economy on a per capita basis as important as Sweden, I will be a huge country. Okay? Because I have 125 million. But Brazil has almost 180, 200 million. And they are going to stop growing when they are about 350 million. I am going to stop growing when I am about 150, 160. Meaning in population terms. So even if I reach, I will have to reach tremendous levels of per capita income to be the most important economy in the world. Okay? So China is going to be the most important economy in the world because of the sheer size of the population and the fact that they are increasing the per capita income. But the Chinese, an average Chinese, will be making less money than an average American, yes, for a long, long time. Yeah, well, there are many other questions. So resources by themselves are important. The most important resource is the person, okay? So what do you have to think in terms of policy? You, you're I'm hoping that you're not going to be in government, okay? That none of you is going to be there. That all of you are going to be business persons. What you will then be asking the government is the kind of policies that will allow me as a business to be richer. And one of the most important is I need people with the skills to respond to this international competition. Education, therefore, must be the most important element of public policy if I really want to be competitive as a business and as a company. And if you do not give me the people, then the second question I'm going to be asking is migration policy. Because I want you then to allow me to go and look for the people that I need. If I don't have a highly skilled technician in Mexico because you didn't prepare him or her, I need to go and get him somewhere. And so, tough luck. You didn't prepare well the people. I mean by this, your government, you don't have policies. At least you have to let me as a business person be able to bring that person. 
wherever that person may be in the world. Because the next alternative is, if you don't do that, I'm going to move my shop. I'm going to go away. Because I need that person for my business. Okay? So human resources. But the fundamentals of an economy, as the economists put them, you were in the way. The balance of payments, because there you can check the, if you're to or export. Or okay. So the balance of payments implies what for you? I mean, that sounds nice, okay? But what is it that we are saying? Balance of payments. That means what? That you want that balance of payment to be in surplus? That you want that balance of payment to be in deficit? That you want that balance of payment to be in equilibrium? Which one of the things? That, that depends on the country and the context. For example, if you are an emerging country, like, I don't know, South Sudan, that is uh, really new, obviously you are going to have a deficit. Ah, but South Sudan has oil. Yes, but since they are starting, they, they need to bring things from outside because they don't have the, the structure to, to have, to, I don't know, to to rely on only on, themse on themselves, they need a uh, resource from outside, so therefore they, they will have a deficit. So you are for a deficit? That, that's not necessarily bad. Okay. Are you for a surplus or equilibrium? Well, I think it depends, right? I think it depends on what? <laughs> In what you country need? Okay, so what do you country need? How do you find out? And you have to go and check in the other, um, I don't know, in the other parts where you have your, where, which folks are you exporting or what do you need? Okay, so the key question that you are saying is, I do believe in free trade. Because of that, I am not subscribing to any of these three as the defining factor for my balance of payments. Is that true for all of you? Can you repeat the question? The way she put the thing is, that depends on, that's what he said too. Okay. Well, we're going to find out what it is that it depends on. But, by having said that, what they said is, I do not subscribe to clear statement that a balance of payments of a country has to be always in surplus, has to be always in deficit, or has to be always in equilibrium. That's really what they said, and you probably didn't realize they were saying that, but they said that. And because they said that, they also said, I believe in free trade, okay? Because it depends. What the status of the balance of payment of my country will be depends. Depends of what? Depends of the needs of my economy. At some points, I'm going to need more inputs from outside, and therefore imports are going to be important. That implies during that time, I may have a deficit in my balance of payments. That's fine. That will make my country grow. That will allow my people to eat. I will be in a good situation. But sometimes... I may be very productive. My exports will be of interest to people outside more than what I'm willing to buy from that people. So I will have a surplus. That's fine. I will have a surplus for some time. And then, at some points by chance, I'm going to be exactly in equilibrium. As much as I buy, as much as I sell, equilibrium in my balance of payments. But I'm not tying myself to any one of these definitions. Therefore, I believe in free trade. Because if I don't believe in free trade, I will say, I want my country always in surplus. Or I want my economy always in equilibrium, which implies I don't want any trade. Or I'm a development, I want deficit. But if it's free trade, then things may happen. And I don't know when they will happen. It will depend on what? It will depend on the fundamentals of my economy. So what are the fundamentals of my economy? Okay, why is it that we say that Mexico is a strong country right now? Because it's a percentage of GDP. 
year. Growth. But we are run very slowly, two, three percent. Yeah. We have a recession in, what, 2008, 2009. Policies and reforms. Reserves. Reserves. So you see, the key question is when you start asking yourself these things. People will throw you these phrases, okay? And I, it has always fascinated me, and I think the same thing happens in medicine, okay? You go to see your doctor, and he says to you, you need an operation. And you immediately answer, yes, when? Why? First question is why? Well, because your fundamentals are not correct. Which fundamentals? Your blood pressure is too high. Aha. Uh -huh. So now I understood. Blood pressure is a fundamental of my state of health. Yes. And also, what else? What else do they check when you go to... I mean, you're too young, but you will go. So what happens is, they will start checking on you and saying, aha, let me see your glucose level. You have diabetes. Mm -mm. So a fundamental of my health is the level of glucose that I have. Okay? Blood pressure. Beats per minute. Wait. And they will give you a list of things that they will say to you, these are the fundamentals of your health. Well, you may not believe this, but up until recently, people would just walk to a doctor and would do whatever the doctor would say to them. In fact, I'm afraid many of you will still do that. You will walk to the doctor, and the doctor will say to you, you have this and this and this. Just because I look at you, you look healthy. So you are healthy. Okay, thank you very much. Let me go with one who makes the tests that perform those tests I need to make sure that I'm healthy. I may look healthy, I may not be healthy. So I perform tests on my health. But that was not the case. And there's still some doctors, and I went to see one the other day, and I walked to him and I said, you know, I have this pain here and this and that. He says, ah, sure you have this thing, take these things, antibiotics. And say, why? <laughs> I say, well, I'm sure that you have this type of illness. And therefore, you need these antibiotics. I said, no, you know what? <laughs> Let me go with another doctor that will perform some tests to make sure that I have that. Because otherwise, I'm not sure you're giving the right things. Yes, I need to check what is it that defines if my balance of payments is going to be in deficit or surplus. Okay. So that's going to be a fundamental question in my economy. And one of the questions in my economy is, in order to know if my economy is a sound economy, I want to know what is the debt of government as a percentage of GDP. This is an important fundamental. Okay? If I have only 30% to 35%, as is the case in Mexico, then what I say is this specific fundamental is solid for Mexico. Because what I know is that as a proportion of the total income of the country, their debt is small. Now, the parameters that we use in economics normally are you should have about 60% of total debt with respect to GDP for this to be sustainable, meaning that you can be sure that you will be making payments and service the debt correctly without creating many problems for your economy. Now, we are at 35% in Mexico, so we are much better. Ah, yeah, but the United States is right now 111%. That means that even if they want to pay all their debt, they won't be able to pay it because they don't have the money. Is this a strong economy or a weak economy? Uh, depends. Right now, if I use this one, it is a weak economy. One of the fundamentals. Okay. And so the fundamentals are these macro measures, which you will have to research for, that will define the health of your economy. So what this guy is saying here is, independent of the state of market fundamentals, whether your markets have equilibrium, this, that, what have you, trade reforms increase the likelihoods of a firm's exit from the domestic market. So here he's talking about the fundamentals of the company. And what they are telling to this thing is, you, you may have a company which has been very profitable in this particular market right now. But this is a protected market. This is a market where 
this company can compete because there is a tariff of 30% for imports of the same goods coming from outside. So when I look at the company at that point, the company is making a lot of profits. But the fact is, they are making profits even though the market is strong, people are willing to buy the product and they are willing to pay the price that the company is offering right there. The market fundamentals of the company, what the company sees as the market, their market, are strong. People demand my product, people are willing to pay the price, and I'm efficient in the sense that I'm making a profit. But if I had a 30% tariff on imports, then what I have to realize as a company is the moment they open the economy, I'm going to lose 30% of my competitiveness. Because that was given to me by the fact that anyone else who wanted to enter the market had to pay 30% above their cost to participate in that market if they were coming from outside Mexico. So when I go into free trade, what I tell people is 30%, that was the protection you were getting free from foreign competition in your market, is gone. And so what this phrase says is trade reforms increase the likelihood of a firm's exit from the domestic market. Because automatically it's going to be open to competitors from outside its own system. Is that clear to all? Well, uh, isn't, isn't protectionism more for like developed countries or like mature economies? Because I think uh, developing nations need actually trade, and I think that's what Singapore did like long time ago. So now it's like a big uh, economy. You see, we have now three people who have declared themselves supporters of free trade. Maybe you still don't know why, but you just declare that you are a supporter of free trade. Now, the question is, should we then be free traders in developing nations and non-free traders, protectionists, in developed nations? No, I think they... Well, I don't know how it's called. I think there is a policy that, for example, I think... If I have a company maybe in Australia and I want to export to the U.S., the U.S. will have like higher tariffs. So what a lot of companies do is that they export first maybe to Argentina where they have lower tariffs and they need to do something to the product and then go back to the States because the States will give a lower tariffs to Argentina. So I think that it's, I don't know if it's free. I don't think it's free trade, but it's... And the question, the question, that is not free trade, but what do you believe in? In free trade? Well, I, I think I do believe in free trade. You think? You are not sure? No, I, I'm sure, but it's just like I believe developing nations need free trade. Okay, but so your company happens to be in a developed country, not in developing nations. And therefore, let's open the economy. Yes or no? If I'm a developed or developed? Developed. No. No, no. Don't, you don't believe in free trade. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Free trade cannot be accommodated, okay? Cannot be something that, well, you know, let me see if it is convenient or not. Hmm? Free trade, free trade. If I don't believe in free trade, then I accommodate. I start making all this, well, you know, yes, it is good if. But it's bad if. Well, no, I mean, yes or no? And it's very important because this is where the discussion starts. The whole discussion is going to be, do I believe in free trade or I don't believe in free trade? If I believe in free trade, then I believe in free trade. What it means is I believe that every single country in the world should open its economy totally and completely. Okay? Because that's the only way that I'm going to be able to obtain the benefits 
from trade. What you said right now is very complicated because what I have as a company is if I am allowed, I would rather send my product from Australia all the way to the United States than going to Argentina and then from Argentina going all the way to the United States. Because that in itself increases the cost. Because I have to set up shop in Argentina. The question is, will you set shop in Argentina if you didn't have to do it that way? And if the answer, as it is implied in your example, is no, then it is better to have free trade than not to have free trade. Because why do I have to take my little business from here, make it there, and then send it there? doesn't make sense. Yeah? It will be simpler and easier. Just ship it directly to the United States. No, you have to go to Argentina because Argentina has what? Argentina has an exemption that I don't. If I produce in Argentina, I reduce my cost, which is artificially increased by a tithe in X percent, which is exactly what we're saying here, okay? If I, all of a sudden, have a company that is competing on internal market, in its domestic market, but the reason why it's making profits is because there is a tithe to imports of 30% from competitors from outside that market, then even the strongest of the firms competing and working in this market is going to find out a big surprise. And it is going to be when the tithe disappears, I'm going to face people sending the product from Australia, not from Argentina. Okay? And at that point, I'm going to find out all of a sudden that even though I thought that my market was good for me, is no longer the case because now there are people from outside. And so what the book says, what this paper says is trade liberalization increases competition in the product market. And this likely explains reduced plant survival following trade reforms. So what they did is they did an analysis and they found out that as you open the economy, the likelihood of bankruptcy, if you want to put it that way, of many domestic companies working and operating in the market was very high. And so, if I am a business person who is making a livelihood because I'm being protected and the protection goes away, I'm going to be against free trade. Because I'm going to find out all of a sudden, gee, I wasn't that competitive. I was competitive because the guy had to send from here to here to here. Okay? This is important that you understand because what these guys are saying is, one of the most difficult reforms in any economy is a trade reform. Because it has an in, in, immediate effect on the likelihood of exit, meaning by that death of many companies operating in that market. You need to be competitive at what point? At the point of being competitive internationally speaking, not domestically speaking, okay? I'm gonna give you the word, just let me finish this. And so, what the guy says in his paper is, one of the reasons why you have all this xenophobia, anti-globalization, etc., from many places is because any country that has attempted trade reform has found out very quickly that a large number of the companies operating in that market went bankrupt. And therefore, the impact of trade reforms is very fast in the economy. And it's not necessarily positive, it's negative. Many companies go bankrupt, many companies get out of the market, many companies, therefore, will not be providing labor, employment, in that economy very quickly. So what you have here is interest groups which will be reacting very fast and saying, wait, 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 if you do that, I'm not going to be able to produce, and if I don't produce, all of these people are going to be without jobs. And you have these nice alliances of people, the guys who have work and the guys who have the companies who will walk to the government and say, don't do that. Okay, I want you to read the newspapers because you are not doing it. I want you to read the newspapers because today there is a series of discussions what's already happening in Mexico in this regard. What is happening in Mexico in this regard is at the end of the administration of Calderón, the then Secretary of Economy agree and sign decrees 
whereby they reduce a lot of tariffs in a lot of products, particularly affecting the agricultural sector. The new administration of Peña Nieto is already backtracking on that because what they got immediately was the political pressure of many people in the agricultural sector walking to them and saying, if you continue with that, we're going to disappear. And so this discussion is happening today in Mexico, and it's taking place in the newspapers. You have to read them, okay? Because I'm going to be asking questions like that in your exam. And so you, you better bring them to class and we discuss it here. This is the point that he's making. The point he's making is when you're talking about reforms in an economy, trade reform is very difficult because of the immediate aspect of loss of companies, loss of jobs. And therefore, it's going to be one of the reforms that are considered the worst. If you look at the income distribution that trade has brought, and in addition, the fact that most of that has happened because many companies who were inefficient disappear very quickly from the market, then you will find out why is it that the isms, this nationalism, this anti-trade situation happens. This is what they say. You had a question, sorry. Um, I do believe that free trade is better than protectionism. <coughs> what I don't understand is why isn't the economic spillover enough for the gap to continue to open? I'm not saying free trade is bad, but it's not good enough, is it? You believe you see? This is like honesty. Can we be half honest? Can we be one quarter of honest? No? So you have these statements made in Mexico. Well, you know, what do you think of this person? Well, you know, he's quite honest. Quite honest or honest? Better than most. Well, is he honest or not? Yeah, you know, honest, honest, honest. Mm, not really, but I mean, he's nice. I mean, he's very honest. What do you mean by that? Well, that means that 99% of the time, he's going to be honest with you. Oh, great. What's the name of the guy? Well, you know, I don't remember very clearly. It's this guy who used to win the Tour de France. What was his name? Greg Lemon? No, 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 the other one. What's his name? That is so he was kind of honest. Just a little bit, okay? The only reason why he was not fully honest is because he didn't tell people that he was doping himself. That's nice. But, you know, most of the time he was honest. I mean, when he was really endorsing products, he was honest. No, free trade, either you believe in it or you don't, okay? So I'm going to tell you why. It is very important as a concept that either we believe in things or we don't. Now, once you believe in a thing, you have the fundamentals, really, as values of why I believe in that. And then you can defend free trade. The problem is if I start really saying, well, it's half yes, half no, then the problem is I'm not going to really believe in that now. What you may want to say is, look, I do believe in these things, but I understand that it's very difficult to apply them at that particular time. Or I have to find out then why it's not happening what free trade theory told me that would happen. And that's where the policy mistakes are. Okay, well, that's my belief, but, and, and you can believe something else. But, but the point I'm making is, if I believe in free trade, I believe in free trade. And then I'm going to believe that these things should be done this way. And then I'm going to try to figure out, yes, but if I don't do the other complementary actions that are required in a society for this to work, then doing this is not necessarily going to result in what I thought it would. Okay which is really your point, please. But it hasn't happened. Yes, I just showed you right now. 75% of the population are not really getting the benefits the way they should. So why? What's happening? Then free trade doesn't work. No, free trade works. But there are other aspects that we need to fix. And all of this has a purpose, okay, in the course. Don't think that it's just because I am a 
Taliban. That's not true. One, two, three. Okay. I don't know. Will there be a food chain of corruptions? Corruptions? I don't know how to say it. These are the words that are very difficult for all of us. So you have to practice them like a thousand times. But, but then you have to think, for Americans, it's very difficult, some of the words. So we are in equilibrium. If you move Cuba, you move Venezuela, and then you move Singapore, you know, I know what's better, but works better for free to take. I don't know is better, but works better. Yes. And then you have to figure out why. And then, this is not a class of political economy, but then the next question will be then, you know, democracy maybe is not necessary. Yeah, Singapore is not a democratic country. And this is going to go on a statement right there, so yeah. Well, I, I want to know, like, um, do you believe in Twitter? Absolutely, totally, yeah. That's one of the biggest problems I have in Gork. Mm -hmm. Um, do you think that in the future, uh, maybe because we're seeing now like in Brazil or Argentina that there are a lot of policies that are um, in favor of protectionism, um, do you think that in the future there will be a country that sells the idea to the entire population and the population itself buys the idea that protectionism is better? than liberalization and free trade, and they completely close their borders to any other country in the world, and they say, we can do it by ourselves, we don't need any product from the outside, maybe a, a, small, a small country or a big country that sees that liberalization and free trade are, well, not that great. Yeah. It is against nature to believe in free trade, okay? So it's easier to sell a protectionist story than a free trade story. Follow my drift? So what you are saying is exactly what's happening. What happens in most societies is it is easier to tell the story that protectionism is more the right policy than free trade. Okay? And because I, I'm going to say that, I'm going to start really practicing those policies. So what I do is I protect companies. As I protect companies, these companies become supporters of non-free trade policies, protectionist policies. And then they start talking to their workers, and they tell their workers, if they open the economy, we are going to disappear. And therefore, this is bad for the country, because what it will create is unemployment and a diminution of demand. Therefore, we should protect ourselves. Yes, yes, certain amount of free trade. Yeah, that's okay. But not in my little pigs. Yeah? There's this story about the pigs, and it was, we have to give the pigs to the people. Yes. Okay, then give me your pigs. No, no, my pigs are different. Okay? Those I keep. The rest you can give away. Because there is a natural feeling of protect me more than anyone else. So free trade goes against this sense. Okay? And so what, what you want really is free trade because of the things that supposedly it brings into the society. But those things, if I have a society, an economy, where already we have a closed market, when I open the market, I'm going to hit immediately this company. And so the reaction immediately is going to be, no way. Because I'm going to lose jobs, I'm going to lose many things. And who's going to be the winner? The foreigner. The Chinese. Look at all the discussion of Dragon Mart right now. What is that discussion? Have you read about it? What's happening right now in Cancun? 
Should we allow the Chinese or should we not allow the Chinese? No. Why? Oh. Because. I'm going to raise you from free traders. Well, it is, I, I, the thing that they want to do, I don't know. What do they want to do? They want to make a center, like, I don't know how it's called, I forgot that they want to live there and to create their, and their enterprises there. Mm -hmm. So it's like a small city for Chinese. Mm -hmm. China town. They are in China town. So you like um, have you ever gone to Chicago? No. Yeah. I've gone to Chicago. You have been to San Angeles? No, I've gone to Houston. Houston? No, I've gone to Houston. Never? Never. Oh my God. We should make a trip to the United States to show her what happens in Los Angeles where you have all these Mexicans in one barrio. They call it the barrio. So, the Chinese want to do the same thing. Oh, poor Chinese. Why not? Well, because it will... Um, it will be full of Chinese. Be less, okay, <laughs> less jobs, and it will be less jobs for the Mexicans. Why? What, what, what makes you believe that? Because it will be, there will be more competition. Ah, that's a good word, okay? So, the important question is, this is going to increase competition. Okay? And as more people compete, either I am more efficient or I lose my job. G. If you lose your job, guess what happens? It's because plant survival gets reduced. So exactly the discussion that we just made a point that is happening right now in Cancun is this point. Okay? So the key question is not whether we believe in free trade or not. I mean, let's say you don't and I do, it is becoming irrelevant in that sense. What is going to be relevant is trying to understand what is the mistake in what they are doing in Dragon Mart. Why? I understand why they are getting so much opposition, okay? They are getting opposition because what's happening is the moment they put this thing there, they are going to reduce costs. Same thing with Walmart. Anytime, this we did, I did a study when I was Secretary of Economy, and we did a study of what happens in a town when Walmart establishes itself for the first time? And you know what we discover? On average, prices will drop 40%. On average, in that community, prices will drop 40%. Prices of what? Price of the products that these guys sold. Who bought those goods? Consumers. Who were the consumers? All the population. And so the benefit is very clear right there. 40% of prices going down means with the same income I can buy more things. I'm better off than I was before. But we also found out unemployment grew very fast. Because what this did is by the time they got there, all these mom and, shop, you know, mom and dad shops which were around went bankrupt and disappeared. And so unemployment happened very quickly. Exit of firms happened very quickly. This is the point of why there is this reaction against trade, okay? Because what trade does, if you have something closed before and you open, then competition gets in, and as competition gets in, the inefficient markets, despite the fact that they thought that they could compete when tariffs are gone, they lose it, okay? So, if your market is not Mexico, but it is the world, what is it that you want in order to define the right strategy for your company? Okay, you are Dragon Mart. You came to Mexico. You made investment. And then all of a sudden, because of this reaction, people say to you, we are not going to allow you to do business. So you wonder, wait, 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 let me see. I went to see someone and they told me that I could. And once I put the thing, they tell me that I can't. What shifted in this process? Fear. 
appear to people. And it transformed itself into what? Into negligence and worse than, worse than that, you were the company that made the investment. What is the translation for your company? Uh, I and so the question that you ask yourself is, was it the right strategy or not? Maybe not. Maybe you should you should have approached the people first in a different way and not just ask, ask for the permission. Okay. How do you approach the people in a different way? This is your business. You are now the owner of Dragon Mart. Maybe making them see it the way, like, Comparing yourself to Walmart or to another big enterprise or big business that has worked over. So I'm the guy who has the shop on your side, who had all these clients before, and all of a sudden you come to me and you say, look, let's be nice. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put you out of business. But it isn't the benefit of the people. What am I going to say to you? In, in, in well-spoken English, I'm going to say, the hell with you. I'm not going to do it, okay? <laughs> so you're going to say, well, I don't care. I'm going to do it. And you say, no way, I'm not going to allow it. Why is it that I'm not going to allow it? Because I know the right people, and you don't. Wait, wait, wait. Is this a business of who I know? Do I need to know people to make business happen? This is very complicated. If my business strategy depends on whom I know, then it becomes very complicated. How can I decide where to invest, where not to invest? How can I decide how many people to hire, how many people not to hire? If everything depends on Mr. Chavez waking up from his dead thumb and saying, I allow you to do business in Venezuela. Why? Just imagine what's happening right now in Venezuela. Many of the business deals that took place in Venezuela were because the government of Chavez allowed them to do business. With Chavez's death, which I think is already happening, if not happened, but then everything is going to change. In fact, what we're watching right now in Venezuela is a struggle, an internal struggle between people trying to stay with the government. Because if Chavez is really dead, or if he dies in the next few days, they better settle an internal fight. But it was terrible for them because what happened was everything happened in the wrong time. I mean, come on, Chavez, you have waited until the 10th of January. Take cover and then die. That will have solved the problem of the world, yeah? Because then the vice president is the vice president. But because it was before, no one of us know if the vice president is really the president or not. So he goes to Cuba comes back and brings a signature in a letter saying that the president has signed this order whereby we have a new minister of foreign affairs. And everybody looks and says, can I see the guy signing, please? Trust my words. I walk into the place and he signed. Can I see the document to see that it is not? No, 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 you have to trust my word. He signed it. I was with him. And in fact, he's, you know, telling jokes. Let me tell you the joke that he told me. Think about what I'm saying. Yes, I'm making a joke of the whole process, okay? But think what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, unless we have the right institutional framework, doing business is very complicated in a world like that, okay? So what do you want as a company? to define the right business strategy for your company is certainty. And the only thing that gives you certainty is the right institutional framework. And what is the right institutional framework? Law. And laws that will be followed. So the right institutional environment that you want particularly in a world so complicated like this world, is you want strong institutions. Why? First, because trade will change each agent's reference of what is optimal level of institutions. 
This is exactly what's happening right now in Cancun, okay? It's because the Chinese came, then the institutional framework that will allow them to set up shop there is no longer convenient for the ones who were there before. And so what they are saying right now is exactly what we were talking about, okay? Is you didn't talk to the right people. So I don't need to talk to the right people. What I need is to have legislation that tells me correctly and exactly what I need to do to set up shop in that place. And if I'm following the law, if I'm following the law, then no matter who the people are, I should have respect for what I decide because I follow the law. Ah, but you didn't follow the law. Ah, that's a different thing, okay? If you went and you talked to the wrong people, <laughs> then it's a game of people. And because you did that, you deserve to be punished. And therefore, if that's what Dragon Mart owners did, they should not be allowed to put the shop in there. Because what they did is they didn't follow the law. So the key question there is, did they or did they not follow the law? I honestly don't know, okay? I haven't followed that. But if they did, then they should be allowed to put their shop. If they did not, they should not be allowed because they didn't follow the law. But from the beginning was wrong. So if you want to have the right business strategy in this world of ours today, you want to be sure that there are rules of the game that everybody respects. Those are called institutions. And the first institutional framework that you want is the legal institutional framework. I'm going to follow the law. I'm going to do things according to the law. Gee, 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 gee. You know what, Walmart? You didn't. You went and you paid off people to let you sit close to the Teotihuacan pyramid. You don't do that, my friend. Okay? If you do that, your shop should be close. So the key question to us is, why didn't they close Walmart if they didn't follow the law in Teotihuacan? Therefore, the institutional framework is not operating. And if it doesn't operate correctly, either in my benefit or in my, then I should ask for that to be the most important thing. Again, what is important to you is to understand that because once you go into trade, then what kind of institutions are optimal will change depending on what my benefit is. And you don't want that. You want a set of rules that will be there and that will be followed by everybody. Otherwise, it's very difficult to make the right business strategy. Who I know, yeah, but then he dies. And then what happened the next day? The opposition got in charge. And because the opposition got in charge, now I'm not going to give me a set of rules that become the law that everybody will follow. Then I know that I can work within that legal framework. The second effect is trade opening shifts political power to our larger firms. Okay? So I want strong institutions because I know, first, that the concept of why institutions are optimal will change among the people who participate in the market. But the most important thing is this has been proven now. In any political system, the strongest, largest, the biggest, the more rich firms will have the biggest power. And if they have the biggest political power, they're going to be able to influence decisions in the political system. And therefore, I don't want that. I want a set of rules that will be free from political influence. Because otherwise, I know that if I'm a medium-sized company, I'm going to be losing against the big, large company, which is exactly what we're saying, why benefits are being distributed differently. Not because free trade is bad, but because it is done in an institutional context, which is allowing larger firms to take advantage of the system. That should not be allowed. Okay? Which one of these effects will prevail will depend on the size of the country. This is the whole element of this paper, which is a very good paper, by the way, where it will tell you with numbers, with things, with results. Now, if you want to read it, be my guest. You can find it in the IMF page, you know, web page. But the point that the paper is making to all of us is institutions count. A legal framework free of political influence is very important if we want free trade to function and operate in the world. Why is it important in terms of this course? 
Because I'm going to be telling you that trade agreements are important, and so you have to understand why. This is the reason why they are important. Because if I don't have trade agreements, then I don't have the institutional framework that will allow me to invest in country A or in country B. Because then I will have to start thinking every single time, who do I know in country A? Who do I know in country B? What are the possibilities that these people will remain? What is going to be in order to make my business decision? And if my business decision is on the fact that I know Mr. X, then my framework for profit retribution has to be short. Okay? If every six years, whoever comes to power in Mexico changes the rule of the game of foreign direct investment in the country, then if I am a foreign direct investor, meaning if I am an investor coming from outside who's going to make an investment in Mexico, has what period to recover the investment and the profit that we are looking for? 20 years? 18 years? 12 years? Or 6 years? Well, it depends. If you got right there at the middle of the time, you only have three years. If you got there at the beginning, six years. If you got there in the fifth year, only one year. And therefore, my business strategy will be dependent not on what is the right investment program and everything, but can I make my profit in one year? Because if I don't, then I better deposit my money somewhere else. Is that clear to you? And it has nothing to do with free trade, okay? It has to do with, well, let me put it correctly, nothing with free trade theory it has to do with the environment in which free trade operates. That's why it's so important for all of us to make sure that we have the right environment. And the environment implies legislation. NAFTA, and this is the end of the class, okay? NAFTA is one of such institutional arrangements. Because once I sign NAFTA, I don't depend on the will of one single government. It has to be the combination of three governments. Ah, well, I can still find failure in that. So the best option would have been a free trade agreement with the world. Because then it will depend on the opinion of the world and not three countries. So NAFTA is a better alternative? Yes. Better than what? Than just a single country. But it is worse than an overall worldwide agreement. Okay? This is where we're going to start. So the questions that I send you for the first class are going to be answered next class. Okay?